Hey Brick Maniacs, welcome back to another Friday sit rep. Our spring sale is still going strong. Use that promo code BKM15. Save yourself 15% on most everything on BrickMania.com. We also have the grand opening for our Vallejo location, our Mare Island store, uh, opening in Vallejo, California tomorrow. Uh, very much so looking forward to seeing everybody there and getting that store officially welcome to the Brick Mania family, even though it's been open for a little bit already. Um, so very excited for that event. But we've still got a bunch of stuff hitting BrickMania.com as well. So let's dive in, take a little closer look. All right, let's kick things off with our spotlight pre-order. This is the Apollo 11 command module designed by Austin and Amanda. Guys, you've really taken it to the space race as of late, and now the month is getting ready for more pre-orders. Tell me a little bit more about this build. So yeah, this is the Apollo 11 command module. Uh, it's the next logical step in our series of uh, American space capsules. We did uh, uh, Mercury a few years ago, then Gemini last year, and now we're on to Apollo. Um, one thing that you'll notice immediately about this is uh, the configuration that this model is in. You see it has the, uh, the orange flotation mm -hmm. ring and the white balloons around the edge here. So this is actually the capsule in its landing configuration. Mm -hmm. So this is post-mission, this is splashdown. Imagine the cloth here is the ocean right. and uh, the, the divers and the Sea King are coming to rescue them. We thought that this would be really cool from a sort of mock perspective to be able to lay the capsule out like this, especially pairing it with our upcoming Sea King mm -hmm. model. Yep. Uh, you know, the, the mock potential for that we figure is really cool. Cool um, display opportunity. If you don't want to display it in this configuration, we do include the pieces and instructions to build it in its sort of in-space version uh, sure. with the completed cone. It has the docking adapter on the top. Uh, we do not include the parts for the service module just because that would have you know, added an extra zero onto the cost of the kit, to be completely honest with you. one thirty-fifth scale space is something you really have to approach with a delicate <laughs> touch with what you're actually going to build, or you can really get outrageous fast. You're not lying. That is for sure. I have seen people who have built the entire Saturn V rocket in one thirty-fifth scale, and it's 12 feet tall. Mm -hmm. it's <laughs> That's awesome, though. Yeah, as cool as that would be as a Brickmania kit. Right. I, I Maybe a box. Yeah. 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 There's a couple of very well-known builders um, who build nothing but space, and there's you can see her at every single show. Um, I can't think of the name off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, she does a lot of different scales to help like regulate that. Yeah, sure, cool. Yeah, I guess I can talk about some history behind this, and then maybe you want to talk about the build a little mm -hmm. bit. So, so yeah, this is the uh, Apollo Command Module Block Two. A bit of history, the origin of this, why it's called Block 2 and all of that. Um, NASA was already planning to go to the moon uh, before JFK ever gave his speech. Uh, they, they were like, hey, this would be a cool project, let's just start working on it. Uh, he gave a speech that riled up the country, they started diverting a lot more resources to it, but they were already working on this uh, long in advance. And they were working on a model that was called direct ascent. Basically, a really big rocket launches a really big capsule, it flies straight to the moon, the whole thing lands on the moon, they get off to the thing, the whole thing flies back up, goes back to Earth. Uh, the issue with that is that it would have been very, very heavy and very expensive, but it was mechanically and engineering fairly simple because you don't have to have all these parts that separate and dock and join together and all that. Makes sense. So, NASA thinking, A, we have a long time to do this because the whole end of the decade thing hadn't come up yet, and B, this is the route we're gonna go, <coughs> they contracted North American Aviation to build a capsule that would support this model. Uh, the capsule looked basically the same as this, but it was going to have a very large landing structure attached to it, so they would land this entire capsule on the moon and then get off and do their lunar EVA. Um, <laughs> exactly, exactly. exactly. Uh, but then JFK comes and says, hey, we can do this before the end of the decade. And NASA's like, uh, uh, what? <laughs> Say we what now? <laughs> Did anyone ask us if that was okay with us? Yeah. <laughs> so Boss then, uh, just drop something for you. Yeah. So then NASA starts having to completely rethink how they're doing things like, okay, we have to fast track this whole program. They realize that the time it's going to take to build the ridiculously large rocket, it was going to be like twice the size of the Saturn V, it's called Nova. That was what they needed for their original direct ascent plan. They're like, we don't have the time to do this before the end of the decade. We need to use the existing quote unquote small Saturn V that we already are working on. Um, the so they came up, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> so, so they came up with uh, the, the, what we now know is the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous mission mode, where 
only a small part of the whole stack will land on the moon and they leave the rest of it in orbit. What that meant is that now this capsule, which was originally supposed to land on the moon by itself, has to have the ability to dock on the end with a sort of daughter ship that's going to land on the moon. Uh, that meant that they had to redesign the capsule and uh, North American Aviation was not super thrilled about being told a couple years into the development, hey, you got to nope, start over, ground zero. <laughs> uh, so they said, what if we keep what we already have and you can do some testing with that and then we'll also start working on a second one? And they said, yeah, no, that works. So uh, they, they made the block one version um, and they did some testing with that, and uh, unfortunately, that led to the uh, the fatal Apollo One fire accident. Because the the Block One version, it wasn't designed to dock. Uh, the other issue is that the door was not ever designed to be opened in space, uh, so the door was actually pressure sealed. So as the pressure in the capsule built up, the door was sealed against it. It was sealed closed. There was no way to open it, and that's why the astronauts couldn't get out uh, after the Apollo One fire. Wow. When they after that, they, you know, they did some major changes to Block 2. Uh, they already wanted a door that was able to open in space because if they needed to do any maintenance on the, the lunar lander or anything, they needed to be able to open that. But that led to the, uh, the much improved, much safer Block 2 version. They fixed a lot of issues after the fire. They fixed a lot of electrical issues. They redesigned the door. Um, they added the ability to dock to the lunar lander. And yeah, that's, that's how we ended up with this capsule here. Um, and yeah, North American Aviation is an interesting company. They're actually the company that designed the P-51 Mustang. They built the X-15 rocket plane. Um, so they have a lot of interesting history, and they are now a part of Boeing. And Boeing is still continuing to design space capsules to this day with their uh, Starliner capsule, um, if that ever flies. <laughs> cool. Wow, that is an impressive breakdown. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. That is, that is really, really cool to know a little bit more behind the history of this model. Let's talk a little bit, though, about the play features as well and then whatever potential printing we've got around the corner. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, a lot of printing um, that will be coming. We'll have the door will be printed. Um, the uh, SLAM has developed some awesome uh, window pieces that will be printed on there. Um, ports and thrusters and all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, it's going to be awesome. Uh, there'll be a nice two-panel um, interior um, with all the cool yeah, buttons yeah, SLAM and gadgets. Has, uh, SLAM has put together a really, really awesome uh, UV printed control. control panel Fun. for the inside. Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever seen the movie Apollo 13 or the documentary Apollo 11, you'll recognize a lot of the very iconic analog dials. And mm -hmm. uh, um, you did a great job. Yeah, he's actually, uh, it's got a little mission clock on there and he has the time on the mission clock set to the uh, the moment that they actually splash down in the sea. So if you have it built in this configuration, <laughs> you'll know that the clock inside is showing the right time. That's really, really cool, wow. <laughs> and he's, he's UV printing the seats with some really cool details of the, the sort of canvas straps that they have in there. Uh, and it's gonna come with three minifigures as well. Which oh, all awesome. fit inside. Yes, they, they do all fit inside. Side by side. Uh, you get, uh, you'll get Armstrong and Aldrin and Collins all in here. You know, here. I was almost afraid to ask because <laughs> it's one more than the Gemini, yep. but that yep. is so awesome yep. to hear that they fit so, inside. So if you look here, uh, mm -hmm. this is the main hatch. It does open, it does open outwards. Um, and if I don't know if you can see that in there, yep. but there are, there are three minifigures. And, uh, these three minifigures are actually wearing the spacesuit. These are the uh, Apollo astronaut figures that we sell separately. These are not the three figures that no. will be coming with them. Um, if you've ever seen the famous photo of all three Apollo 11 astronauts standing next to the sort of model of the moon in their, in their blue jumpsuits, that will be the figures that will come with them. Oh, very cool. Uh, the inside of this capsule is what was known as a shirt sleeves environment, which meant that it was designed to be comfortable and safe enough to just wear normal clothing. So they had just these sort of jumpsuit style flight suits that they would wear. Uh, that also means now that we will get faces for Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin, uh, and hair pieces and all that. So um, that's spoken like somebody who's looking forward to collecting their own piece of work. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that that'll be Austin cool. Austin doesn't um, collect them. No, no, and, 
Uh, otherwise, if you want them to be in their EVA suits, if you have uh, three of the lunar astronauts, you can uh, you can put those in there as well. Which we are restocking. Yes, At we, some are. Point, we yes. are bringing those back. We'll, yeah, when we figure out the, <laughs> the, the schedule, whatever that means. <laughs> oh, right, it's a true story. Very, very cool. Anything else we want to go over play function-wise? I what should point out else? quickly uh, what these big balloons here are for, because mm -hmm. uh, you always see these balloons in photographs of it. Uh, these are actually emergency measures in case the capsule happens to land upside down in the ocean. Uh, so there was an electric air compressor that would fill these full of air, and then the idea is that that would float it upright mm -hmm. to the top. And this ring was not actually a part of the capsule. This was deployed by the uh, by the divers, the rescue divers. Frogmen. Oh. Yep, the frogmen. Um, so they would they would drop out of the Sea King helicopter and they would drop this package down in the water with them because the uh, the capsule was rings. perfectly watertight and perfectly seaworthy. Uh, the reason for the flotation ring is so that once they opened the door, if it was high seas, if water got in, it wouldn't sink the capsule. That actually almost happened in one of the Mercury missions, which oh, is wow. why they started doing these rings in the first place. But yeah, that's that's why we have the uh, the There's iconic a lot of videos, balloons in the collar here um, of the frogman jumping in and then starting to attach the uh, ring around. It's very interesting. Yeah. What an absolutely cool piece of history, and like you guys were saying, very excited to see what people do mock-wise with this, yeah, because that is, uh, there's a lot of potential here. Now available on pre-order on BrickMania.com. Amanda, Austin, thank you very much for checking in. Thank, thank you. you. All right, moving on, we've got another pre-order. This is yet another project with the Patton Museum. This is specifically his M3 Stewart uh, from the Desert Training Center designed by Mary Wilson. So she's here to talk a little bit more about this build. I'm assuming there's a lot of similarities between the previous Stewart that you did, but this one kind of has a cool angle to it with being, you know, the, the general's training uh, <laughs> tank. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, okay, so the last Stewart I did uh, was an M5. Mm -hmm. So, and then the previous one before that was an M3 like this one. So okay. that one had kind of the cool, uh, like striped camo on it. That was the, the British honey? version. Yeah. Yep, the honey. Um, so General Patton's, uh, again, is one of those, uh, so the M3 had a few different versions where it had like a rounded turret at some point, but this is one of the earlier versions. So the turret is like all angular. Mm -hmm. um, so and got, taller, it looks like a little bit too. Yeah, a little. So the the hatch is raised on top for this one. Okay. Um, so I used those nice like angled uh, two by two bricks, so we could get those um, in there. And I just want to point out right away that. I wish we had the printing on it, but this <laughs> this printing is going to be so cool because there are stripes around um, along the back sides, and then these front slopes, and there's stars on the side, and so you can see that there's like a little bit of it is brick built, just so. I mean, we can make the, the most of it, Yeah, right. Um, but it's like a pl plate with uh, thickness of another white stripe that goes all the way around. Oh, so very it, like, cool. it looks a little bit incomplete right now. That's because like the printing really like flushes it out and it's going to look so good. Um, That's kind of unique to get some of those markings on a tank because yeah, not necessarily sure. combat markings. Yeah, That's yeah. Cool. And it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of iconic. Like uh, General Patton has quite a few images of him standing out front with like the, the binoculars mm -hmm. or like what he was looking through like a, a telescope thing too. Like he's just like <laughs> posing in front of it. And he's like, a showman, that's yeah, for sure. Right? <laughs> and so like we have all these great images of it. So we tried to get as many of those markings as we can on there. Very cool. The, the turret especially like stands out um, in this design. And then he also has a few of his own like flourishes on it, I guess, in addition. So there's two flags out front. Mm -hmm. um, both are different. One is just his, uh, like the general stars. So I think it's, he's only a two star general. At this time? At this point. Okay. Um, so it's it's on this flag here. And then also we're printing them raised on this little placard. Oh, very so cool. A little he texture has printing. This, yeah. yeah, he has this plate on. Ooh. <laughs> he has this plate on a few of his his vehicles in in different ways. So right here, it's just kind of like held on front. Um, cool. And this is a little bit bigger than it's supposed to be, but like it's fun. We have to and get it. It makes it, in it there. pop. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right? Um, so I'm super excited to get the the raised stars in there too. Mm -hmm. So that would be fun. Um, yeah. Okay. So other than the printing, uh, it has you know like tank tank treads move. Uh, the turret spins. You can get it over the the front flag, so you can get like the full 360. Okay. Um, this elevates and depresses, and then like the hatches, and we've got hatches in the back as well. You can saw those doors. Yep. So there's room in there if you want to put anything in there. Um, 
Patent snacks. Patent snacks. Patent brand chips. <laughs> um, and then yeah, we've got it. We've got it loaded up in the back with some extra, like a shovel and an axe and whatnot. Um, and this this patent figure is it's a new figure for this one. He's wearing. Uh, a different kind of jumpsuit, and then he also probably young Patton too. I don't know if we've necessarily slightly okay. Slightly younger. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, as young as Patton gets. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. Um, and so the reason we went with the aviator, the Lego aviator cap for this one, is because he wears this like very, like old timey football helmet. Nice. And we thought that this helmet actually represented it very well. So instead of using that new tanker helmet, which is a little bit more refined, we were mm -hmm. like, he's wearing this weird chunky helmet. This actually kind of works. Like, it actually, yeah, it works very well. And he's got the binoculars there, so you can recreate those, those famous images you got. So, yeah, I think that's about it for the build. It's very similar to the previous M3 I built, but obviously it's all in dark bluish gray and got some more details in there. Um, had to change a few things up because just of like piece availability and like sure. different colors, but um, I'm very happy with how it, how it all turned out. So Yeah, definitely one where we're excited to see the, uh, the finished product and another must have for patent collectors and a cool initiative uh, with the Patent Museum again. Mary Wilson, thank you very much for checking in. This is now available on BrickMania.com. All right, moving on to our new releases. We have the L118 light gun designed by George Hicks. Nate, our project manager, tell us a little bit more about so, this uh, build. This is a British artillery piece used by the British in the late Cold War, and as well as uh, the Falklands in 1982. Um, it's got a typical, sort of a woodland camo scheme, actually. It's typically, cool looking. It is cool looking. Like Typically, the, the British just used uh, dark green and black, but I kind of like the inclusion of the brown just to help it stand out a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Plus, it kind of matches some of the other stuff going on. Yep. Uh, you can remove the legs to have it properly Deployed. Deployed, yep. yeah. nice. I like that muzzle brake, too. Is that 3D printed? Oh, yeah. No, that's a brand new muzzle brake exclusive to this that uh, Austin and Amanda printed. I'm kind of sad that it, I haven't really seen this muzzle brake on anything else because it's a solid-looking muzzle brake. Yeah, it's really cool, especially for the size. Usually you see those in there. I could big. see this being on, like, a modified Sheridan or something. It's mm -hmm. a nice-looking barrel. Yeah, it's definitely very clean-looking. Yeah, it rotates up and down. You can tow it to the back of uh, the LR101 or another truck we're coming out with later this month. Nice, okay, cool. Actually, I don't know if that truck can hold the weight of this, but we'll find out. <laughs> Lego-wise, you could. Lego-wise, yes. Uh, IRL, that's thing. debatable. Uh, we got little cylinders on the side. Those mm -hmm. look nice. I think those addition I actually came up with. Oh, nice. To make for a cheaper piece. I could be wrong. Because it's been a while since I worked on this because I got a bunch of other stuff for uh, June lined up working that on. Does, that does happen around here, doesn't it? Yeah, a lot of stuff. Like, It's like, hey, we're going to do, we're gonna do like, uh, hypothetically, a Korean War month. But that's like six weeks on the line or six weeks ago. And I'm already working on stuff for like uh, September right now. <laughs> so I was like, wait, what? I did this? Oh, yes, I did. That's kind of how it is for... A lot of the stuff for the Falklands. Coming back and remembering the projects. Yeah, especially yep. these new releases when it is in a pre-order. So I yeah. understand. Oh, yeah. This is just straight up a new release, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Buy, uh, buy it preferably It is now. available now. Absolutely. But Any printing? I don't think it comes with a minifigure, right? No minifig and no, no, no printing either. I mean, so I guess the instructions printed. have printing on them. So <laughs> technically, all kits have printing. There you go. Loophole. Uh, but yeah, that's about it. Just a simple howitzer mini kit. No minifig. It spins. And there you have it, available now at BrickMania.com. Nate, thanks for checking in. Mm. All right, taking a look at this week's standalone minifigure, the Argentine Infantry, designed by Landon. Uh, kind of a theme, obviously, continuing yeah. with the commando here, and obviously the theme is Falklands War, so tell me a little bit more about this minifig. Right on, yes, this is the Argentine Infantry. Um, very similar to the uh, previous Argentine commandos. Um, it, that was kind of something I noticed that, uh, you know, you, you would see a lot of variety of gear with, within the commandos, but you also would see some of the rank and file uh, equipment as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that gray jacket uh, I kept seeing over and over um, in both the commandos and with just the regular infantry. So I thought that'd be nice to just um, have both of them in here. Um, and this also allowed us to produce a lot more variety in the minifigures themselves. You know, it's, it's like I would love to get to everything and... Um, make a completely from the ground up unique minifigure, but it's nice when we get to uh, um, get some variety in, in sort of a short month, right? Well, and they look good standing next to each yeah. other. You know what I mean? That's that's kind of the cool part of it too. Right. It really completes that crew feel. So maybe uh, next time Falklands War Month rolls around, um, you know, we can uh, we can upgrade 
Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll explore the entire lineup here down the road. Who knows? Um, for the infantry, uh, one of the iconic things, this is like a special request from Dan. It's like, oh, you got to do the, make the guy with the, uh, with the goggles on, on his uh, helmet. Okay, I was wondering why that was called out so specifically. Yeah, and yeah it's, you'll see these pictures. Um, um, like all, all of these guys just lined up taking a picture in with all their goggles on. And it's, it's, it's just something that stood out, I guess. So uh, we hit that with a little layer of gloss as mm -hmm. well. So that picks up the, the light very nicely. Um, and that's on top of, uh, we just used like a Mitchell pattern helmet. Yeah. Um, I think they might have had their own um, kind of a woodland-based camouflage, but I wasn't exactly sure on what it was. And close approximation. Yeah, it's a close. It's a close camo that we had ready to go. So, um, it's, um, but overall, it's it's still just a cool helmet. I mean, if you wanted this, even to pick this up for a Vietnam minifigure, yeah, that, right. that would work perfectly for that as well. Um, yeah, the jacket again. That's uh, an Israeli-made jacket um, in that kind of grayish. Uh, maybe a little bit of greenish tinge to it in real life, but we just opted for dark, uh, dark bluish gray here. Uh, very close approximation. The iconic leather, I think it's, I think it's Italian leather. Yeah, right, that green um, shine to it. Not positive on that, but um, the only other place I've ever seen that leather really before would be uh, World War I um, Italian um, ammo pouches. So it's interesting to see that popping up here again. A, a simple loadout I added. I got a new bayonet, a little scabbard there on the oh, side. Oh, yeah, cool. And a canteen on the other side. I'm loving the really tall boots um, with the pants kind of just tucked in um, pretty cleanly. I love the jacket strings oh, yeah. right up on the neck. That artwork yeah. is really, really clean for being so teeny. Yeah. And these, um, it's sort of such a simple uniform that you almost could use this. Like it's got specific gear, but it's fairly simple. You could almost use this for other uh, minifigures as well. If you put like a a brick arms plate carrier over this. You have, yeah, sure. you have like a completely different, uh, that could be a ton of different countries. So, mm -hmm. um, that's cool. This thing's kind of ready for, for customization. Uh, that's that, man. Oh, what, what is that on his face? Amanda jumped in, MNR girl, and she did a nice, uh, um, she's got funny faces. That yeah, she's, I, like I think that. she does okay, a good cool. job catching the character of, of people. So I don't know if she based this off of a specific person, but um, she does a, a good job at producing face artwork. So sometimes I'll loop her in and. Yeah. Can't make a few faces for me. Can't do it. Can't do it all solo, man. That's awesome. Use those. Use those tools at your disposal. There you have it. This week's standalone minifigure now available on BrickMania.com. You got anything else you want to go over? No, I don't got anything. Go? Okay, fair enough. Thanks for checking in. Thank you. All right, so that'll just about do it for a Friday sit rep. Very much so. Looking forward to meeting everybody at the Vallejo Grand Opening tomorrow. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for watching.